problem in social science. Um, and what, first of all, maybe we should talk about what, what is uh, the problem within the social sciences and sort of where it came about and, and what do you think, uh, how serious is it? I would say that social science has become something of a poster child for the sorts of problems I'm about to discuss. But in some ways that's unfair because these same underlying problems in research apply to many other fields, including medicine, where the stakes are much higher. You know, if in psychology we publish some papers and we're wrong about something, then we can go back and update our model of the mind. But if I'm if I'm publishing a paper in medicine about whether a drug is helpful or harmful, the stakes of being wrong are potentially somebody's life or a mm -hmm. lot of people's lives. Um, and yet, unfortunately, within medicine, some of the same problems that have been highlighted in, within social science uh, also apply. And in some ways, there's more feet dragging within medicine because I'll put it this way. There were some high profile happenings within the world of psychology and social science starting in 2005 or so, uh, but uh, uh, around 2012 was when this kind of started to take off where there was this very public conversation about whether we could trust the results coming out of psychology and mainstream journals. And a lot of people were arguing that there was reason to think that maybe half or more of the studies in major journals just were non-replicable, that if you tried to do them again, you wouldn't succeed. And that could imply that the original result was not reliable or that it's only something you can get under very specific conditions and we don't know what those are. And so it led to this epistemological crisis where people said, suppose it's the case that about half of studies in the main journals in psychology, at least in some areas, won't replicate. Unless we try to replicate all the studies in psychology, that means we don't know which half. And if that's true, we don't know anything. Um, and if that's true in psychology, how much more concerning is it if that's true in biology and chemistry and um, you know medicine and, and in other areas? So why do people start to have these, these doubts? Um, I'd say an opening shot in this conversation was a paper that came out in 2005 by John Ioannidis, who's a meta-scientist at Stanford. Uh, it's, it's a paper called Why Most Published Research is False. Now, as I recall, his paper was actually fo focusing on biomedical science, and he built a model uh, that, that included reasonable assumptions about the process of doing science. So one assumption that's built into this model is that journals, for the most part, are not interested in publishing negative results or right. failed experiments. And this isn't benign because just to give you an example, you know, if 20 laboratories are all working on basically the same problem and they're running roughly the same experiment, let's say 19 of those experiments don't show a result that appears to be interesting, but one of them does based on the kinds of statistics that are prevalent within psychology and other disciplines, chances are that that one apparently successful result is a fluke. It's a type one error, a false alarm. But because of these, this publication norm, which is prejudiced against null findings, the only of these 20 results that will be published is the one that looks like it was successful. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at just the published literature, you're not going to know about those 19 other failed experiments because the, the researchers who did them are going to say, well, I'm not going to be able to get this published. So I'll just put it in my file drawer. So this has come to be known as a file drawer problem. Um, so even if you have a meta-analysis of the published literature, it's typically only an analysis of what's been published. But if you have a prior publication bias as to what gets published that doesn't show you a representative sample of all the work that's been done on the topic, then even your meta-analysis, which is supposed to be this you know, fabulous synthesis of the available evidence, is not going to be reliable. Systematic reviews aren't going to be reliable. So even all these things that are supposed to be gold star quality of evidence, if it's based on an unrepresentative sample of the work that's been done because of this publication bias, that's a systematic and deep problem. And so this is one of the assumptions that uh, John Ioannidis put in his model. I don't remember all the other ones, but uh, one of them that people are now aware of is flexibility in statistical analyses. So I'll say something about what's called null hypothesis significance testing, because this is still, I don't know, 99% of psychology papers, me medical trials, you know, if you have an RCT testing the effects of some drug, uh, they'll typically use null hypothesis significance testing to determine whether the drug worked. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the way this works is you, uh, you, you have a control group and an experimental group, and you put some treatment or stimulus or something to, to this group that you expect will have some downstream consequence. And then you go and you measure the average outcome uh, between the two groups. And you wanna see if the average outcome, whatever that is, you know, a number of lives saved with the drug or something like that is higher in the treatment group than in the control group. And the way that this has been done for 
decades now is where you compute a p-value and a p-value just means if the null hypothesis is true in other words in this example if there's no difference between these two groups in reality given that i can't sample the whole population i'm just taking a sample of the population and i'm inferring about the population right. if there's no effect here what's the likelihood that i would have seen this difference in means or whatever is the outcome you're looking at usually it's a a mean of a distribution and so the the reasoning goes like this if there's no effect here and this result that I got would only come about, say, 5% of the time under the assumption that there's no effect, then we're going to go ahead and say that there's no effect. Now, that's not a valid inference. I mean, all you can say is, if, if there were no effect, so the, the statistical test is actually assuming there's no effect, assuming there's no effect, how likely is it that this thing would have come about? And that's all you can say. You can say, if all the assumptions of my model are true and my measurements were accurate and all the other background assumptions of my you know, reasoning are, are accurate, this would happen 5% of the time. That's all you can say. That's one of the things that could happen. It could happen 5% of the time. But you know, even that inference you can't really draw because typically this wasn't the only study that was run on that topic. There would have been you know, 14 pilot studies that you did in your lab trying to figure out which measurements you should use. So then the p-value doesn't actually mean anything. And so if everybody's relying on this method where uh, we don't see all the times that the study was run, and we're already going beyond what you can really infer from a p-value to this kind of on or off judgment about whether there is an effect or not. It's, you're building a lot of inferences about what, what exists in terms of outcomes on, on quicksand. Uh, so one of the problems here is what I referred to a moment ago with flexibility in how you analyze the data. So just as an example, let's say that I look at my distribution of results and I've decided in advance to kind of bind my hands, so I'm not analyzing the data too many times, that, that I'm going to define an outlier as everything that's like, I don't know, two standard deviations outside the mean. And then I go and I compute my test and I see that I get a p-value of 0.06. Now, historically, a, a p-value of 0.05 was considered the threshold for what we as a community are going to decide counts as uh, sufficiently unlikely that we'll go ahead and say that, that this would not uh, this would not uh, happen if there really was no effect. So we're going to say there is an effect. And that was, again, that's just a convention. There's no particular reason why you should pick 5%. Some studies pick 1%. So now you have another problem, which you have different thresholds of significance between, yep. between studies. Um, so, so if you get 0.06, then you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to be able to publish this because that counts as a null finding according to this arbitrary convention of my field. But maybe you think there really is some sort of effect here. And so you, you look at your data again and you say, well, you know, actually it looks like maybe these things are sort of outliers too. So maybe we'll redefine an outlier as like 1.5 standard deviations outside the mean. And then you compute your statistics again and now maybe you get a p-value 0.049 or something like that. And then you go, hallelujah, I can publish this result. Well, the problem is the more times that you run the data is just like running an experiment 20 times where you, you're, greatly in, increase the likelihood that you're going to get a p-value below this statistical significance threshold by chance. Uh, and so again, the p-value stops meaning anything from which you can draw any kind of inference, much less the original bad kind of inference that I was mentioning, um, the more you do this. So, so this was widespread that researchers were, you know, you analyze the data this way and then you analyze it that way and then you drop a few more outliers and you do this or you run the study again, whatever. Okay, I'm, I'm giving this story in probably far too much detail than is necessary to make the point, which is that these kinds of things, standard research practice, not done nefariously uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are probably some fraudulent researchers here and there, but for the most part, this is just standard. This is what good faith researchers are doing. And they didn't realize that the downstream effect of these uh, flexible choices in statistical analysis, the downstream effect of prejudice against null findings in terms of publication um, and, and various other factors made it mathematically extremely likely that more than half of the published literature just is false alarms, just statistical noise. Uh, that looks like a result. And so this, yeah, this was in 2005. Then there were some efforts in around 2012 to try to actually go ahead and replicate some of the main findings that had been published in various areas of research, including psychology. And in a famous instance of this by the Open Science Collaboration, they were able to get about a third of, of the studies that had been published in these psychology journals that they were sampling to get a statistically significant result. And again, there's debates about whether this is even a good measure to determine whether you've successfully replicated something. But anyway, if the original result was, was significant, 
the follow-up result was significant in like 33% of the time, which suggests that fewer than half of the studies were replicable according to this definition. So, okay, all that's to say that um, there's very good reason to think that a lot of what's published using standard research methodologies is looks like an effect, but it is not an effect. And that's true in psychology, it's true in medicine, it's true in other areas. And because we don't know exactly which studies are the ones that are replicable or not, we have kind of broad uncertainty as to what we know. And so there are pretty, to my mind, very serious epistemological consequences of this, which is that when I see a study come out in The Lancet, it says, blah, 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 there was in fact, I actually just kind of shrug my shoulders until I see that it's been replicated a bunch of times, until I know whether there were other trials that were run that weren't published, mm -hmm. that I don't know about, that are sitting somebody's file drawer somewhere. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you're using null hypothesis significance testing and I see one report of this thing published in a, in a journal, that to me counts as very little evidence that I should confidently believe in that claim. And so, you know, when we're deciding what should we do with our medical treatments, what should we believe in, what psycho psychological effects do we think are real? Um, right now, I sort of just, I, I, I suspend judgment on a lot of these questions. I'll, I'll maybe say, what do we have the most reason to believe given the available evidence and given that I don't have some alternative theory of why it might be some other way, but it's an extremely defeasible view that I hold about these things in, in most areas of research that rely on these very practices that I've been discussing. Well, so what you just laid out there, I don't, I don't think you actually gave it too much detail. I think you laid out exactly um, what you just did was you, you basically, it took about five minutes and broke down um, any kind of research methods class one would have taken in graduate school. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I felt like it. I was maybe dwelling on some details, but you know, no, sure. No, okay, I, I, th I think they're very good because what, but what I think is also important, I mean, you lay out quite well why internally that this, um, this crisis has developed uh, based on sort of internal reflection or sort of meta-analyses, which is in essence the same thing. What, what, I, what I think is, is often missed and um, not, I don't want to say taken into consideration, how did it come to be that this system was this way? It really was a question of how do you establish prestige as differences amongst these journals and then prestige therefore amongst the differences within universities. Um, like there is an well, incentive it's, it's, structure. That's, that's, there's definitely a problem with incentive structure. So, but it's not only that. So just take mm -hmm. an example. If, if, if you run a study and you think that you're going to be able to reject the null hypothesis and say, yes, the drug worked or yes, the stimulus had some effect. And that doesn't happen. One reason why it might not happen is because there's no effect there. Right. Another reason might, might happen is because you ran a crappy experiment. And right. you don't know. It's ambiguous. So, and so, so if, if I'm a journal editor and I get a null result, one good faith reason why I might say, I'm not going to use my limited page space back when journals were printed on paper. Now, again, this has changed because we can just you basically put everything up on the internet now. So there's really very little reason not to do so. But mm -hmm. back in the day of limited journal space, it was it was maybe a reasonable decision for a journal to say, well, yeah, it's an, I don't know how to interpret your null finding. It could be that you have provided evidence that there isn't something of interest here, which would be good for us all to know so we can stop wasting money pursuing that research question. Or it could be that you're, you didn't do your, your experiment properly. And so maybe the null result just means that you need to run it again with better measures or something like that. So given that I don't know what to infer from this, I'm not going to publish your paper. So that was, that was part of why this prejudice against null findings came about. Um, but the prestige thing is, is, is definitely true. I think a lot of journals want to publish stuff that works because they want to say, we found something. Whereas saying we, we didn't find something is certainly not very interesting. If you could say, we found that something is not the case, that's a stronger claim. If you can provide positive evidence for the null hypothesis, then if people ever thought that was true and you've, if you've shown that it's not true, that would be very interesting. But it's actually really hard to demonstrate a negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just the background things that have to be true for your statistical inference to count as evidence in favor of the null is like much harder to do than to, to uh, suggest that something does exist. So. Um, there's perceived reasons. There's also just reasonable editorial decision making that was going on. But in the aggregate, it had this effect that people just stopped writing up studies that didn't reject the null hypothesis, put all that stuff in their file drawer, and then the studies that get published are not representative of what was done. And so those p-values that are reported are not meaningful. No, I no, I think that's right. And I, I didn't mean to imply that it that it was a, a sort of a multivariate. Oh, it's just prestige. Like, oh, it was just class, or it's just materialism, yeah, or something. Sure, of course. No, yeah. no, no I, but I think it is. It is the sense that people sometimes forget that the fish are swimming, um, and like universities are in competition with each other. They have to find ways to distinguish and di differentiate from one another. And the way that we set up these models 
about a century ago was differences amongst prestige among the faculty. And the best way to do that is by saying, look at how many peer reviewed articles I've, I've developed or peer reviewed books that I have and how much of this I have published. So not only, I, I think my, my, my point is to expand, not only is this sort of a crisis in, in social science, this really is kind of a, a crisis within the prestige structure of the university, sort of the esteem that they have developed and built for themselves and the faculty that have come along with it. This is not going to be just contained to social science research. Um, I think the crisis is going to expand outward because of how many of the underlying suppositions are built on the things that have come out of the, the social science research for the past 50 years. Maybe not, but- uh, well, no, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I read a profile some years ago of Peter Higgs, the guy who predicted the existence of the Higgs boson, which mm -hmm. then was this big discovery in physics. And you know, I think he published like two papers or something since the 1970s. And he said, if, if I were trying to get tenure under the current conditions where <clears throat> a certain amount of output in prestigious journals per year is seen as a prerequisite for proving that you have the kind of status that the, your university wants to celebrate, um, I, I never would have figured this out. I just had to sit and think. I mean, I couldn't just be churning out articles all the time and I had to do some deep thinking and I had to you know, um, do what traditionally might've been thought of as the role of an academic is to get to the bottom of things, not staying on top of everything uh, in right. terms of these su superficial metrics that, that are being uh, thrown your way. And so, yeah, I think the incentive structure of contemporary academia is a very serious problem if what we want is people to take their time and think deeply about difficult questions and uh, summon the right kind of evidence to answer them convincingly, that's not really what's favored by the current set of incentives. No, that yeah, there's there's kind of an aversion to paradigm shifting things because they take decades to do. I, I mean, I, I think about, um, so again, Rawls's contribution sort of in ethics and in, in political science, political philosophy, it took him 20 some odd years to write uh, Justice is Fairness. Um, and uh, the idea that I mean, it's probably the most influential in a certain sense of political philosophy in the 20th century, um, or at least one, everyone had to respond to it. I guess I should put it that way. But if you if you're having to put out that as piecemeal chunks eh, once a year to make sure that some uh, somebody in, you know in the higher ups is not breathing down your neck the whole time, do, does this actually become something seminal or does it just get lost in the noise? Um, which is the, I think the bigger concern in the the academy now is how much really good what could be seminal stuff is just getting lost because it's so there's so much static around it. Um, Okay. And we, we won't know. That's the most difficult thing is we may not know. It may, we may not come to light for decades, um, yeah. you know, and which I think should be something that, that academics should take really seriously, not just for themselves, but like, what are the things that I'm not getting to think about or should be thinking about because there's so much other stuff. <laughs> um, and I think it's a really serious problem. Um, so I'm really glad that you, that you illustrated that. 